All right. Revelation, last church. Not quite the last session on the last church. We're in session two on the church at Laodicea, part four. But session two of the section dealing with how to avoid becoming like Laodicea. In parts number one, two, and three, and then last week we switched gears, but one, two, and three, we saw what the church of Laodicea was like. Then last week, which was part four, was actually session one on how to avoid becoming like Laodicea. And so tonight we're on part five, but it's actually session two of how to avoid becoming like Laodicea. We're in Revelation chapter three, beginning in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white garment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love. That tells us something about the church. I rebuke and chasten. That tells us these were real believers. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. What an incredible privilege, just for getting back in fellowship. Overcoming the temptation to sloth and carnality and worldliness. Even as I also overcame, Christ was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He overcame. Even as I also overcome, overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood, New Jersey. What the Spirit saith unto the churches. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us to overcome. Help us to learn what your word has declared is necessary to overcome. You never give us a command to do something that you don't also tell us how to do it. So as we examine tonight how to avoid becoming like Laodicea, or in the event that perhaps we individually and I hope not, but corporately as a church, have fallen into the kind of lackadaisical non-fellowship that Laodicea had, that you will help us to learn how to overcome, how not to become like Laodicea. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I moment mentioned a moment ago, Laodicea was a church filled with true believers, but it was an entire church that was out of fellowship. And Jesus wanted to have fellowship in the church. That's what verse 20 is all about. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. That's fellowship. Having dinner together and he with me. Laodicea was very much like the modern compromising neo-evangelical charismatic praise and worship churches that focus on social justice and feel goodism instead of separation under the gospel of Christ. Now, I know that there are those who use verse 20 as a salvation verse. And when they're witnessing to people, they say, Jesus is standing outside the door and knocking at the door of your heart. Just open up and, and you'll get saved. But that's not the context of this verse. People who trust Christ will be saved. And there have been people who have been led to Christ, even though that's the wrong application of this verse, 
uh, just like there are wrong applications of Psalm 2, uh, where it talks about Christ smashing the nations with a rod of iron. Uh, you know, ask of me and I shall give thee the nations for the inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And many missions conferences use that. They say, all we have to do is ask God and he'll give us the, the nations for inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for a possession. That's not the context of Psalm 2 because the very next verse says, and thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt crush them like a potter's vessel. That's not missions. <laughs> so always make sure you have the context whenever you are quoting verses. Now, it's right for us to go for missions, but it's not right to use Psalm chapter 2 to try to um, motivate young people to go to missions because young people don't go out and break them with a rod of iron and crush them like a potter's vessel. Uh, that's what Christ will do at the second coming, and it's a second coming psalm that deals with Christ judging the nations, putting down the Antichrist, and establishing his millennial kingdom. So what we see here in Revelation 3.20 is a verse that deals with fellowship, not an offer to salvation. Instead, it's an offer to have fellowship. I will come in and sup with him and he with me. The church at Laodicea was a church of genuine believers. Jesus wasn't offering the church, if you'll just open the door, all of you unbelievers, I'd love to come in and have dinner with you. But they were totally out of fellowship because those in fellowship are hot for Christ. Fellowship with Christ, not merely fellowship with other believers, is one of the key requirements for the victorious Christian life. Without fellowship with Christ, a church will grow lukewarm like the church at Laodicea. The Bible commands us to exhort one another to love and to good works and to have fellowship with one another. But before fellowship with other Christians, we must first be in fellowship with Christ. And fellowship with Christ is not a point in time kind of an action. It's not punctiliar action like certain things are stated in the New Testament as once and for all kind of actions. Fellowship with Christ is a habitual lifestyle. So tonight, how to avoid becoming like Laodicea session two. Constant spiritual growth is essential to becoming, to avoid becoming like Laodicea. Last week I gave you the old saying, when you stop growing, you're dead, and the same is true of spiritual life. When you stop growing, you're spiritually dead, and that's what happened at the church at Laodicea. So what about us? If spiritual growth is essential to spiritual life, what spiritual medicines must we take to keep from becoming like Laodicea? And the answer is in our text. Fellowship with Christ is the first key to spiritual growth. Laodicea had lost it. They were saved but totally carnal. So how do we go about growing spiritually our entire lives without growing stagnant? Many people have been Christians for a long time but have never grown spiritually. So here's what we covered last week. You can outline spiritual growth through a series of steps and we covered the first two basic steps in spiritual growth. The first related to salvation. The believer's new life begins at the moment of salvation, spiritual birth of John 3. You must be born again or you must be born from above. You cannot grow spiritually unless you're born again. You know the foundation. There are two basic elements that I gave you many verses on last week. So I just summarized those two elements. Number one, the new life is received by faith in Christ as personal savior not receiving him as a generic savior, not receiving him as an institutional savior, that is, I belong to a church, therefore I am saved, not grandma's savior, well, my grandmother was a believer, so I guess I'm on my way to heaven. You have to receive him as a personal savior. That's where you get your new life, through faith in Christ as your personal savior. Second, the second part about the new birth the believer receives a new spiritual birth the moment he or she genuinely trusts the Christ of Scripture. Now, there are a lot of weird cults out there who do not have the Christ of Scripture. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is actually Michael the Archangel. That's not a Savior who can save you. The Mormons believe that Jesus gave special revelation uh, to the American Indians and that uh, by trusting in the gold plates that Joseph Smith found via the angel Moroni, that somehow you're going to make it to heaven. But the Jesus of Mormonism 
is not the Christ of Scripture. The Christ of liberalism is not the Christ of Scripture. The Christ of liberalism merely is a man who goes around doing nice things and gets sacrificed with a a martyr's death. But he didn't die for our sins. He merely died as an example. You have to have the Christ of Scripture. So a believer receives the new spiritual birth the moment that he or she genuinely trusts in the Christ of Scripture. The God-man who died for our sins on Calvary's cross was buried and literally and bodily rose again from the dead, which is the guarantee that salvation is true. So that's what we covered last week. And I gave you many, many verses that deal with that. Number two, and we covered the first part of this last week, spiritual growth begins immediately after spiritual birth. You don't get born spiritually and then 15 years later you start to grow. If you had a baby that was like that, you would think there was something wrong with the baby and there would be something wrong with the baby. Spiritual growth begins immediately after spiritual birth. And as we saw last week, spiritual growth is required Spiritual growth is not an option for obedient Christians. We saw that there are two reasons that spiritual growth is not optional. So I'm going to summarize for you. We gave you lots and lots of verses last week, but I'm going to summarize the two principles why spiritual growth is not optional. Number one, spiritual growth is not optional because spiritual growth is commanded by God. If something's commanded, it's not optional. Since God commands us to do it, that means this is the human side of the equation. There are two sides to the equation, the human side and the God side. But since God commands us to do it, there is a human side of the equation. You see, God expects us to be actively involved in spiritual growth. If you are not actively involved in spiritual growth, you are not growing spiritually. If you are not growing spiritually, you will become like Laodicea. Okay, let's talk about the active involvement. Spiritual growth is not passive, just like physical growth is not passive. To grow physically, you need food, you need exercise, and you need rest. To grow spiritually, you need spiritual food, and that's the Word of God. You need spiritual exercise, that is, putting the things you have learned into practice. And you need spiritual rest, times of meditation on the Word of God and times of prayer. These are elements that are necessary that you must put into practice. If you don't, you will very quickly become like Laodicea. Now that's the human side. What about the divine side? This is number two. Spiritual growth is accomplished by the Spirit of God as we yield to him and follow his direction. That's the divine side of the equation. There are certain things that you cannot do that only God can do to bring about spiritual growth in the life of the believer. So now let's look at some verses on each side of this equation. Here are some of the verses related to our responsibility, the human side, what God commands us to do. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Here's what we're supposed to do. God gives some promises, but to get the promises, you've got to do something. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. How do you cleanse yourself? Peter tells us with the washing of the water of the word. That's how you cleanse yourself. But you're responsible for doing that. God is not going to miraculously jam everything about the Bible into your head. That's not his part of the equation. His part is when you study the word of God so that you can cleanse yourself, he'll give you understanding. Illumination is understanding on the word that has already been inspired. Illumination is not getting new things from God. Illumination is where God shines light on the page so you can understand it. Having these promises, you got some promises. How do you put them into practice? Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh 
and spirit. That means you've got to do some self-examination. You've got to look in there and be honest with yourself and say, you know, this is dirty. This is something I need to clean up. I got some thought patterns that are not righteous. I have some words that I say that, as I think about them, those are really filthy in the eyes of God. I have some motivations why I do certain things that God says are really dirty. I have some actions. I better clean up my act. I have some attitudes. God says, those kind of attitudes are dirty. He's not going to come down and just jerk all those things out of my life and make me perfectly holy and give me instant sanctification like I'll have when I get to heaven. He gives me and he gives you the responsibility of cleaning up our act. If you don't do that, you will be like Laodicea. That's a command that God gives. That means it's not optional. That means you better obey it because God chastens disobedient Christians. And then it says perfecting. That is bringing to maturity holiness in the fear of God. He's dealt with both the body and the spirit. In the first phrase, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Now he says, when you bring those things together, what you're doing is you're bringing to maturity holiness in the fear of God. The book of Proverbs tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the holy is understanding. But you do not have wisdom until you start with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We are to perfect holiness in the fear of God. That is, you begin to meditate on who God is. And as you begin to do so, it should cause you to tremble if there is sin in your life. The way to get in fellowship with the Holy God is not to make God dirty. The way to get in fellowship with God is to make yourself clean. God has given you means to do it, the washing of the water of the word. He helps you find where the dirty areas are because he gives you the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. But he tells us that we are responsible to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. By the way, um, some time ago, and um, the individuals won't be able to watch this on the internet tonight, we have uh, a problem with our internet. Uh, Facebook has knocked us off the internet, and we're not quite sure what the reason is. But they said, somebody has complained about us. And uh, so as a result, when anybody complains about you, and they have like 75 different reasons why people can complain about you, but they didn't tell us which reason people complained about. Uh, so we have been off for the last two weeks and are not on today, although we will be able to upload this sermon um, tomorrow or whenever uh, our technical staff gets around to uploading the sermons onto our website. But it can't stream live over Facebook. But um, anyway, so, but there was someone who listens to the sermons who had said, please give us some verses to memorize that will be good for us and for our family uh, to memorize this series that I'm going through right now is a great series of verses because it's dividing up the seven or eight different sections as to how to keep like from becoming like the church at Laodicea. These are great verses to memorize. Okay, the second area where are some verses that relate to our responsibility, what God commands us to do is over in Ephesians chapter four. And I'll be reading verses 15 and 16. First, he talks us to clean up the flesh and the spirit. Now he talks, us, talks to us about what we're supposed to be talking about. He says, but speaking the truth in love. Ah, so you have not just the speech, but you got the attitude. We're to speak the truth. That's what comes out of our mouth. He tells us how we're supposed to do it. It's to be in love. That's the attitude as we proclaim truth. And it's related to spiritual growth. Look at the very next phrase. May grow up into him 
in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So you want to have fellowship with Christ. You want to grow up into him, which is the head in all things. He's the head of the body. We're part of the body. How do you grow up into him who is the head? You speak the truth in love. That's a key to spiritual growth because you may grow up into him in all things. Now, some of us never bother to speak the truth. Oh, yeah, we, we generally tell the truth when people ask us questions and you know, when we're filling out forms and stuff like that. But speaking the truth in love is proclaiming the truth, the gospel of Christ, the tenets of Scripture, the things that God has commanded, the things that God has forbidden, the encouragement, the comfort, the exhortation, the statements of God's view of history. We speak the truth in love. That is one of the main ways in which we grow up. Because it says so in verse 16, the very next verse. From whom, that is from Christ, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Ah. In other words, we're speaking the truth in love not merely to the outside world, but to one another. Because we are to grow up into him in all things, and the whole body is fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. Every joint is doing this according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. And here's where he applies it, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. What did you just tell us in verse 15? Speaking the truth in love. When you do that, you edify. That is, you build up the rest of the body of Christ. You see a brother or sister involved in sin. You speak the truth in love. You see a brother who is discouraged or a sister who is discouraged. You give them encouragement by speaking the truth in love. You see a brother or sister who is ready to throw in the towel. You come alongside them and you speak the truth in love and hold them up. You see a brother or sister who's being tempted to sin. You speak the truth in love and remind them what God says about that sin. That's the way that the body works together. And as the body begins to work together, you not only have individuals who are walking in fellowship with Christ, but you have a church that is not like Laodicea. It's a body that's working together. It's a body that is edifying one another. It's a body that is building each other up so that the entire body is presented to Christ in every measure of every part. We see another illustration of this over in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, here is Paul explaining how he applied the principles of Ephesians 4, 15, and 16 that we just looked at. Speaking of Jesus, Paul writes, whom we preach, warning every man. So there is, here's brothers about to sin. You tell them, oh, baby, baby, don't do that. Don't do that. You're in trouble. If you do that, God's going to chasten you. You're speaking the truth in love. But it's not just that. And teaching every man in all wisdom. Ah, teaching is part of building up the body of Christ because you are communicating the truth of God in all wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. If somebody asked you, what's the principal thing that you ought to be getting out of the Bible? The answer is wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Did you know for the last 50 years or so, that's been one of my daily prayers? In fact, I pray it many times during the day. Lord, give me wisdom. Wisdom is not God giving you new information knocked out of the blue. It's taking the scripture that you have studied, helping you to understand it, and how to apply it to your daily life. That's wisdom. Where God gives you the illumination on what he has already revealed in his word. Not new revelation, but understanding 
what the Bible says, and then wisdom is how to apply what the Bible says to real life situations that you're facing right now. I did a series two or three years ago in which I discussed the differences between wisdom and understanding and revelation and inspiration and illumination. All those different words that are found in scripture that relate to the word of God, but different ways in which the Holy Spirit has applied it. First, when God gave it new. And then how God preserved it. And then how God gives us understanding on it. And then how God gives us application of what we understand. It's all tied together. But for you, if you want to do what this is saying here and what Paul said he was doing, you need to ask for wisdom. James tells us, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But there's a caveat. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. When you ask for wisdom, there's the caveat. You must ask in faith. What is faith? I've given you a definition in the past. I'm summarizing a lot of things for you tonight because I want you to see how not to be like the church at Laodicea. What is faith? And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about faith generally, faith as a gift from God, faith as the fruit of the Spirit, faith as one of the spiritual gifts. This applies to all of them because those are all different areas of faith. Faith is complete confidence in the Word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. After studying faith, every place that word is listed in the Bible, I wrote that definition about 50 years ago. And it still sticks today. And we had dozens of children and middle schoolers and high schoolers and college students and adults, young adults and older people memorize that definition in the churches that I've served in the past. I'd written an entire Sunday school curriculum looking at each of the 200 different key doctrines of scripture. And I saw spiritual growth and I didn't see Laodicea. I saw churches that were on fire for Christ. How important, Paul talks about that wisdom here. Teaching every man in all wisdom and he said, here's his goal as one who was an apostle, one who was an evangelist, one who was a pastor teacher as well as an evangelist. He had multiple spiritual gifts. He said, my goal in preaching Christ, in warning, about, in warning people not to offend Christ, teaching them in wisdom, my goal was that I might present every man perfect, that's teleos, mature, in Christ Jesus. Paul was interested in each individual because he was interested in the church corporately. Oh, he had some problem churches like Corinth where there was a lot of carnality. But by the time you get to 2 Corinthians, it's a church that's grown. It's a church that does have zeal for Christ. They still got problems, but they got zeal for Christ. They are not like Laodicea. He had other churches that were really sound doctrinally, really taking good, solid doctrinal stands, and it took a long time for the devil to get those churches, and we talked about that when we talked about the church at Ephesus, for example. But Ephesus was not like Laodicea. They couldn't bear those that were teaching false doctrine. They were people who were living the truth. Dear people, my heart's desire is what Paul had here, that we may present every man and every woman perfect, that is spiritually mature, teleos, in Christ Jesus. We're going to talk about the application of the spiritual gifts that each one of us has to do if the church as a whole wants to keep from becoming like Laodicea, but here we see Paul exercising his gift in that way.
Verse 29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working which worketh in me mightily. Paul realized that his exercise of his gift was not something that came from the flesh. Here we see the second half of what's necessary. When we obey, then God works in us and through us. I also labor, that's Paul working, striving according to his working. Oh, suddenly Paul realizes, or states, he certainly realized long before that, but states, his working which worketh in me mightily as I present these truths, teach and warn and exhort so that I can present every man perfect, spiritually mature in Christ. You know, if you have folks that are functioning like that, and who are responding as the churches did when Paul wrote to them, you will not have a church like Laodicea. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Here is again Paul stating what our responsibility is. If you want to grow spiritually, if you don't want to be like Laodicea, Paul writes, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. So notice this is not just Paul's big ideas. This is what Jesus told Paul to write to the Thessalonians. Paul didn't make it up as he went along. The Holy Spirit gave it to him. Christ commanded it, just like we find Christ commanding it to the churches in the book of Revelation. I exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God. In other words, it's your job to walk. It's your job to please God, not to please the preacher, not to please somebody else, not to please the rest of the world around you so they don't put any pressure on you. He says, what Jesus told me to tell you is walk. Now walk in the New Testament, you walk by faith. You walk in the Spirit. You walk to the glory of God. How should you walk? But you got to do the walking. You have to please God. Notice you examine yourself, you go back to that first verse that we looked at and think, I got to cleanse myself of all filthiness of the spirit and of the flesh. What's dirty? What needs washing? How do I do it? There's the washing of the water of the word, which Peter talks about, which means I have to go find the passages of scripture that deal with this issue and I have to clean this issue up in my life. To walk and to please God. And he says, you don't just do it for a little while. He says, so you would abound more and more. In other words, you pick up your pace. The longer you walk with Christ, the faster your walk becomes. The more energetic your walk becomes. Instead of becoming tired, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You see, the closer you get to fellowship with Christ, the more energized you get, the more intense your walk becomes, the purer and cleaner your life becomes, the more vibrant and clearer your testimony becomes, the greater the shining of your light because you've cleaned off the glass so that Jesus can shine through you. It would abound more and more. Hebrews chapter 5 gives us some more of our responsibilities if we would grow spiritually. Verse 12, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers. In other words, Paul's writing this to the Jews at Jerusalem, and he's writing it about the time that the great persecution, Titus' army, has surrounded the city of Jerusalem. And there's some Jews who want to go back on their faith in Christ. They've been getting some persecution from the Jews around them. Now it looks like the Gentiles are going to come in on them. And so they have compromised. To avoid being persecuted by the local Jews, 
Because they see certain things are taking place outside and they think, man, I, I, I don't want to be on the outs with both groups. They've decided to quiet their testimony. There are five warning passages in the book of Hebrews. All five of those passages deal with what will happen with compromising Christians. What they're going to lose. They're not going to lose their salvation. None of those passages deal with losing salvation. But they deal with the chastening hand of God. What they're going to lose in terms of heavenly rewards if they compromise. If they decide to remain silent. If they decide to backpedal and go back to their old ways. Laodicea had backpedaled. It had gone back to its old ways. Jerusalem was being tempted to do the same thing, and that's why Paul writes the book of Hebrews. Yes, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews to the church at Jerusalem. He says, you ought to have gone a lot further in your Christian life. You ought to have grown spiritually. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Why do we have to go back to teaching you ABC? Now you ought to be reading philosophy, if you would, and doing trigonometry and algebra. And you don't even know your ABCs. You've digressed. You've fallen back into the old ways. You've gone back to your ignorance. You've gone back under the law. Yes, you have atrophied because you are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, I've preached on this passage before, so I'll only summarize things for you. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. <laughs> unskillful in the word of righteousness. In other words, unskillful in the Bible. Remember, we're supposed to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And how do we cleanse ourselves? By the washing of the water of the word. Ah! When you get dirty again, it's because you become unskillful in the word of righteousness. That is, you are not focused on what does the word say about sin in my life. You've stopped self-examining. You've stopped looking at yourself to say what pleases God and what does not please God. And the areas in my spirit and the areas in my flesh that don't please God, I take the word of God and I wash those areas. And when I do that, I grow. That's what he says here. You ought to be teachers, but you've gone back to babyhood. You've got to have skill in the word of righteousness. Because everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. You know the basics. You know those first two things we talked about. Oh, yes. Uh, a believer uh, who, who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, has faith in Christ, is born again. Got to be born again. And, and then, uh, you know, when we're born again, that means we have to trust the Christ of Scripture. We can't trust some other Christ. We have to trust this Christ of Scripture. Yes, we got it. We got it. That's baby. That's baby. You got that. Okay, that's baby. You have to go on unto perfection. And the word there is teleos. It's the word that means spiritual maturity. You have need that one teach you again would be the first principles of the oracles of God or such become need of milk and not of strong meat for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he's a babe. But strong meat belongeth unto them that are of full age even those who by reason of Get these, there are two words here you need to get. By reason of use. You not only know the scripture, you use the scripture, who by reason of use have their senses. You've got five senses. You've got five senses. It says by reason of use, have your senses exercised. What do you listen to? What do you look at? What do you taste? What do you put into your mouth? What do you smell? What are you sniffing? Are you sniffing glue? 
What do you touch? Clean or unclean? Who by reason of use of the word of righteousness have their senses exercised so the senses become strong spiritually and the senses don't fall into with all those ways in which we communicate with and reach out to and absorb from the world around us. Their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. If you do that, you will never become like the church at Laodicea. One final set of verses because um, we're just looking at the first half right now of the spiritual growth principles. What are our responsibilities? 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing that you know these things before. Peter says, you guys know it. But you know that's not enough. Knowing it is not enough. You must apply it. Therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before. Now here's the opposite side. Not just doing, but being careful to avoid the traps. Beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. See, what's that got to do with spiritual growth? It tells you in the next verse, verse, because that's the opposite of spiritual growth. He says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So it's not just the positive things that you must do, it's the negative things you must avoid if you want to grow. Beloved, seeing you know these things before you got it in your head, beware. Oh, there are a lot of warnings for Christians in Scripture because we are so easily deceived. We are so easily led down the primrose path because we're not paying attention. Beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked. There are those who seem so nice, but they're involved in wickedness. And so they're friendly and we follow them and we're led down the path. And it's the path of destruction being led with the error of the wicked. You know what will happen? The wicked will go forward and go through a set of bushes and you think, oh, I just have to walk through the bushes, but the wicked knows what's on the other side of the bushes. And so the wicked has gone through. You can't see them. They pull to the right. You push through the bushes and it's a cliff. And you fall off the edge of the cliff. Fall. Fall. That's what he says. From your own steadfastness. You're no longer walking in fellowship. You're no longer clinging to Christ. You're no longer doing what pleases Him. You're no longer cleansing yourself from the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. People, if you want to grow spiritually, if you want to prevent a Laodicean life, in your own personal life and in the life of the church. You have responsibilities for cleaning up your own life. You have responsibilities for other members in the church as we saw the Apostle Paul talking about it. Well, when you see them, you warn them not to do these things. You give them scripture. You give them encouragement. You keep them from discouragement by the word of God. And then every member of the body as it works together grows up into Christ who is the head and you see growth in the church spiritual growth and you see a church that's on fire for Christ a church that's vibrant a church that's in fellowship with Jesus first a church that is not like Laodicea
The Lord willing, we'll pick it up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the principles of Scripture that you have given to us so that we might understand how to avoid being like the church at Laodicea. But it involves personal responsibility. It involves obedience to your commands as to what we are supposed to do. You take care of the things we can't do. But you have given us commands and you've given us empowerment to obey the commands. We have to make the choice and take the steps to do what you've told us to do. We can't just sit back and say we're Presbyterians and we believe in the sovereignty of God and we believe in predestination and election and God will save the, those whom he wants to save. No, you've told us to go. And we can't say that same thing about the Christian life. Well, we believe in the sovereignty of God and we believe in election predestination, so if God wants us to grow spiritually, he'll make us grow spiritually. And if we don't grow spiritually, it's his fault, not ours. Heresy. Help us to understand that you've given us commands, and when you give a command, you expect obedience. Father, teach us to grow, make us obedient, cause us to search the scriptures, to be like the Bereans, and then to apply what you illuminate to our hearts, and do it with joy, and help us, Father, to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a second. I have lost the little card. Well, I don't find it, but let's turn to 377. Alleluia, sing to Jesus. We'll stand to sing all three verses. Because indeed we stand in his presence as the King of kings and the Lord of lords.